Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Have you ever taken a chance and switched jobs or taken a new role that would stretch you and take you to the next level? Then start to worry about how you were going to hit the ground running and make an immediate impact? Well, that's exactly what we're going to help you with on today's show. Well, you'll learn about preparing for the first 90 days and tapping into the power of your network, taking brave leaps of faith, and making self-care a priority. Today's guest, Kamika Dempsey, founder of KD Leadership Strategies, executive coach, consultant, and globally fluent facilitator, will be joining us today and sharing her insights. Kamika is a leading expert in business, talent strategy, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. She is a sought-out speaker, panel moderator, and panelist, having served at external organizations like UN Women, the Center for Communication, SIFMA Asset Managers Forum, Credit Suisse, and many more. In this episode, Kamika shares her career journey as a Black female professional and how she navigated her career in various organizations within the world of academia, consulting, and financial services. Welcome, Kamika. Thank you so much for joining the Beyond Barriers podcast. You have an amazing background, and we are so excited to be able to share it with our audience. So, Let's kick off with just jumping right in and you sharing a little bit about yourself, um, your story, and what you've learned uh, throughout your journey. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, This is a really great opportunity, and I'm very appreciative for being here. Uh, So in terms of my journey, I think one of the things that's really important in my story is that uh, without a program called Inroads, I wouldn't be doing what it is that I do today at all. I was an intern the Monday after I graduated high school. And Inroads is, for those who don't know, uh, a program that still exists today, in fact, is going to be celebrating its 50th anniversary uh, this year. And it seeks to place minority students in internships in corporate America and help them to develop the skills and get training that they need in order to be successful in those roles. And for me as a first generation college student and then college graduate uh, in my family, that was really pivotal in helping me to understand uh, the foundation on which I would build my career. So I began uh, working at NatWest Bank Uh, as an operations intern the Monday after I graduated high school. And then uh, through a variety of merger activities that, you know, are par for the course in corporate America, uh, I then moved over to Anderson Consulting and then interned there and then took my full-time offer after I graduated school. What's important, I think, about my story is that at that stage of my career, so the beginning, I was involved in HR activities as a volunteer once I went full-time because of the way in which I had participated in this internship program going forward uh, in my career. And so that really was the place that I kind of got started, if you will, Uh, on this journey because I was a line consultant doing strategy and process consultant for consulting for clients. Um, But then sort of helping with diversity recruiting or campus recruiting, as well as helping to get started some of the uh, DNI initiatives way back then. Um, through a variety of different activities, uh, after grad school, then joined an organization called Duke Corporate Education. And that's really where, you know, the foundation was laid with respect to, you know, looking at developing leaders, executives in particular, and working with Fortune 500 companies around the globe. Then after that, uh, you know, having worked in the administration um, at Yale, then went in-house. Uh, whereas I had been servicing financial services clients my whole career up until that point. Then I went in-house to Goldman Sachs uh, and had a diversity role 
there uh, where you and I work together. Uh, and I was covering six out of 13 businesses from a diversity perspective, really thinking about the employee life cycle. And then moving from there, then went over to BlackRock, where I was responsible for leadership and management development across the firm, as well as executive coaching. And then after a really successful run at BlackRock, started my own firm, KD Leadership Strategies four years ago and have been really focused on continuing to develop talent and uh, executives within Fortune 500 firms. No small feat. I mean, you've had a (laughs) plethora of experience. And what I find fascinating is that you for lack of a better term, switched lanes and industries and different types of roles um, along the way. And so, you know, one that takes a lot of courage of really kind of jumping in. So I have kind of a two-part question in terms of, did you struggle with fears or limiting beliefs in switching to different areas when it may have been completely different or complete different industry? And then two, what helped you accelerate once you got into those organizations um, so that you could be successful quicker? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, mentorship has really been very important in my career along the way. And I'm actually really grateful to Inroads for that experience, because that actually helped me to understand the importance of developing mentoring relationships. And at various points in my time, uh, along the way in my career, I've had a couple of mentors you know, give me really important pieces of advice and feedback that have helped to navigate, you know, the career lattice, if you will, as I've been thinking about, you know, how do I make these moves strategically? What makes most sense? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really been about, you know, thinking through, well, what's going to be the right next opportunity for me and what I'd like to achieve, the skills that I have, and how can I, you know, contribute to an organization? But I would say the two points that one mentor said to me in particular was, you know, you absolutely positively can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. (laughs) And then the second thing is to really think about um, what are the important legs on my three-legged stool? Mm -hmm. So if I think about my career as a stool that has three legs, um, what are the three things that I am balancing at any given time? And that can be personally and professionally. And those are then the uh, anchors, if you will, around which everything else that I do is built. And so, you know, there was a time when I was working at Yale and traveling about 60% of the time, for example, and I had some, you know, personal obligations with my family that then took me traveling personally Mm -hmm. a a long time. And I needed an opportunity where I was not going to be traveling that much because it was starting to wear on me physically. And so, you know, in conversation with mentors, really thinking through, okay, how do I assess what's going to be the the next best thing for me so that I can still be growing and developing in my own career, but also so that I don't feel this strain on my three-legged stool and it suddenly felt like there was, you know, an extra, an extra leg taken away from my three-legged stool and I felt like I was trying to balance two things right. uh, and that was quite complicated. So um, I would say mentorship has really been, been very key in that regard. So what I hear you saying is that taking that analogy of that three-legged stool, always knowing, having that clarity of what those three legs are really helps you accelerate. So gaining that clarity um, in order to keep moving forward. Absolutely. So thinking a little bit about that, you know, and thinking about, as I mentioned um, earlier, that with all of the various different opportunities that you took and all of the experiences that you you learned from and kind of gleaned your your um, or honed your skills, um, you've probably encountered lots of other you know peers and women. But what are some patterns maybe that you've observed that you know from women really showing up with confidence and owning their success in terms of coming into a, you know an, an, a place or an organization that you maybe knew and you know, looking to gain your sea legs, but maybe not, you know, coming in as confident. Yeah. So I would say, you know, it's 
regardless of gender, actually, I think the best thing to do when anyone joins a new organization or even just takes on a new role is really try to spend the first minimum 60, best case 90, even better 120 days doing what I call a listening tour. And really thinking through, okay, you know, who should I be talking to? Who's going to help me to understand this organization, this team, this role, this function, and really trying to get across very quickly. And I would say that it really takes between 90 to 120 days to do that well. Um, but you have to you have to engage others in doing that. And so I suggest, you know, an initial conversation with a manager to help at least lay the foundation. And I can think of an instance where I joined the team and my manager and I were absolutely positively in sync because when we sat down probably in my first or second day, I sort of came in with my list of, you know, who should I meet waiting to fill in the blanks. And my manager actually had a sheet that said, these are the people that you should meet. Um, <laughs> I think that goes back to also how you evaluate a role and who's going to be the right person to manage you and really trying to tease out in advance before you say yes, if this is going to be the kind of environment that is going to enable you to be successful. And in that instance, you know, I fully was supported by my manager and, you know, really grateful for us being on that same page. And then what we did was, you know, then it was really up to me to actually execute on really uh, in, indoctrinating myself into the organization. Right. But that manager was critical in helping me lay that foundation. And so then when we checked in weekly, I would give an update of, you know, these are the people who I've met with in the past week. Here's, you know, some questions that have come up. Here are some answers that I've gotten, you know, answered. Here's what I'm thinking are the next steps. Do you agree? And so that validation feedback loop was really important. No, I, I really like the um, listening tour kind of habit or hack that you've used in terms of making sure, you know, who are the key people, who are the key stakeholders you get, to, you know, you need to get to know so that you can pick their brain and kind of um, align your North Star as to what it is that you need to do to serve them in order to be able to do your role. So I think that's an excellent piece of advice in terms of setting up this, you know, learning tour per se in any kind of role or organization that you step into. Um, <clears throat> speaking of, you know, you are uh, obviously someone who, again, seeks clarity, looks at, is always paying attention to the three legs in your stool, um, and then also being very proactive and making sure you're working with your key stakeholders. Um, but we all know that there's, you know, life happens, things happen, um, you know, and, and we may, you know, fail from time to time. So what has helped you deal with and learn from your failures or setbacks in the past? I would say really finding people that I can deepen relationships with before I need them. Um, so, you know, kind of going along with the theme of the listening tour, I think that one thing that women generally don't do as well as some of our male counterparts is really think about the importance of strategic networking. And, you know, any time that, you know, I may have had a misstep, I am able to course correct via somebody in my strategic network. Everybody can't know everything about every aspect of your career, but there are certainly people that you know within your organization that you can go to. And I think for women and and women of color in particular, we often don't get really good feedback. And so many times I will share with, you know, clients that I'm working with now in my own organization is you know, find the two to three people that you can help them help you. And it can be giving you feedback and you need to ask them very specific because most people actually don't give good feedback, but women and people of color in particular do not get the feedback that we need to continue to advance successfully with an organization. And so if you can find two or three people that you can get really straight no chaser feedback from 
that can be instrumental in the growth in your career. And I can think of, you know, several instances where people have really given me such useful feedback that I have then been able to incorporate that, adjust, adapt, and then, you know, really come back and feel like, wow, I have now really advanced and not gotten caught up in, you know, defensiveness or anything like that, but really taking it on. But I think it, again, it really goes down to having relationships with people before you need them, because then the trust is there. You know that someone's giving you that feedback from a place of they actually want to see you be great. And so they're going to help you be great, but you may have to start that. You may have to create the environment in which they are able to give you that feedback. You might say, you know, it might start out as a conversation on the way to an elevator bank, for example, and saying, you know, hey, so in that last meeting, I'm just wondering, how did I come across? Did you think that I was credible? You know, what could I have done better? And that is something that's so simple. Um, but you're really helping to signal to someone, I need this. I want this. Please, can, can I enlist you in that way? That is excellent advice and, and agree with you that, um, you know, as a woman of color and in and, and not getting the feedback sometimes unless you ask for it. So having to be proactive in, in getting that feedback um, and digging because sometimes you do ask someone like, hey, how do you think that went? And you get the general, oh, that was great. And it's like, no, no, no. But like, really, you know, what could I have improved upon? So maybe it's asking better questions. Um, speaking of that, and speaking of, you know, women of color, and and having, you know, additional challenges that you're struggling with, um, <clears throat> you know, did you struggle with fears or, or limiting beliefs? Or in some case, kind of, um, as you know, the, you know, categorical imposter syndrome? Um, and, you know, Did it prevent you ever from pursuing what you truly wanted? I think for me, it was less about the imposter syndrome, but more, you know, there have certainly been moments, I would say earlier in my career, where I sort of would look around and go, ooh. And there are quite frankly still moments. I was at a breakfast uh, last week where I was actually the only woman and happened to be a woman of color in a room with probably 35 to 40 mostly white men. Um, I haven't been in that kind of a context in quite some time. Um, And it was fascinating because, you know, I took a seat that was that at the head of a boardroom table and I felt like the difference between where I am in my career now and then say if it had been, you know, five or 10 years ago, I may not have taken that seat, but it was important for me to actually sit at that head of that boardroom table because I was the only one. And it was equally important that I participate in that meeting. And so, you know, I spoke up and I made sure that my voice was in the room. Now getting there, I didn't start there. Um, But I think, you know, what I have personally had to be cognizant of is because I come from a family where my dad always told me, you know, hey, Kamika, you can do anything that you put your mind to. I think I probably have a little bit more confidence. But as a black woman, I have to mind that that does not come off as arrogant and that I don't come off as the angry black woman if I am confident about a decision or a way forward, I need to be thoughtful about how do I enlist others in whatever agenda that, you know, we may be collectively working on and trying to move forward. How do I enlist people so that they feel like they are brought along? How do I engage people so they feel like they're contributing in meaningful ways so that, you know, I can balance what it is that I believe is the best thing to do with what others uh, want to do as well. I really love the fact that you were saying in terms of owning, you know, your power. I love how, you know, and as you said, you grow into it, but really there are small things like taking a seat at the head of the table and it's that visibility. And um, also, you know, as you said, speaking up. Um, and and engaging and adding value. Um, certainly, it's something you learn, but you have to first take that step in order to do that and um, and be seen. So, really, kind of sticking your head up and standing out is extremely important. So, 
that is extremely uh, valuable. And thank you for sharing that. Switching gears a little bit um, and kind of going back into um, thinking about switching lanes. So you were in corporate for many years. You were in academia, corporate, um, consulting, and now you've um, kind of, again, switched lanes and started your own company. And I would say, you know, what has helped you kind of manage competing priorities between kind of personal and professional goals? Because sometimes, you know, when you do work for a corporation, in some ways, sometimes you can draw boundaries, I feel almost easier because there is a, you know, the office opens and closes at certain times, right? And yes, you go home and do additional work. But um, how do you manage that now that you've stepped out on your own and, and are, um, you know, running your own business? So I think it's something that in the beginning, I didn't have entirely correct. I was somewhat brave. So I, I wrote a blog post about, you know, the, the decision to go out on my own and do it. And it was really about being brave. And, and that was really my mantra uh, for that first year. But there was you know, somewhere in my unconscious mind and somewhat conscious mind <laughs> that it was a little scary, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, thinking about, okay, well, what, what is this going to look like? Am I going to be good at business development? And so because that mantra was kind of going in the back of my mind or that, that voice was in the back of my head, I had to actively think about, okay, what am I doing? And so I said yes to everything. And what happened was in a period from the end of September to just after, or yeah, right at the Thanksgiving holiday, I had taken 16 flights and I'd gone on a trip to South Africa for two weeks a little over two weeks in that period. And six of the 16 flights were South Africa related. That means that I took 10 flights <laughs> simply for work. <laughs> That's a lot of flying. And what happened was there was actually a lot of stuff going on with my family personally. So I had to do a lot more than usual Thanksgiving cooking. And I made this ginormous spread and, you know, was making sure that people in multiple locations got food and so on and so forth. And then immediately the Friday after Thanksgiving, so Black Friday, everybody's out shopping and doing their thing. I was in bed with the blanket over my head <laughs> because I was so sick. Oh, yes. And I was sick from the end of November until January. Mm. And that's where I realized the importance of setting boundaries for myself. And knowing that, sure, I may be an entrepreneur now and I may have some more risk that I have to manage in a proactive way, but if I don't set boundaries and I don't, again, remember my three-leg stool and assess for myself, okay, what are the three legs now? Now that I'm working for myself, now that I'm an entrepreneur, I'm trying to build a company, I'm trying to build a team what are going to be those three legs? And my number one leg had to be my own health because if my own health sacrificed or was sacrificed in any way, I can't serve my clients. I I can't actually show up for work. And there at the time there was no one else to do it. And so it really forced me that lesson um, to be very clear about my boundary setting. And then I was very clear about, you know, saying, okay, well, I'm going to set some boundaries and those are important to me. And I'm very clear about them with my team as appropriate. But then also it allowed me to really think through, okay, how do I set a very specific goal for each year that keeps me moving forward, but also keeps me on track so that I feel, you know, I'm continuing to be my consistent type A driven, focused person, Mm -hmm. but in a way that's going to allow me to maintain good health and, you know, not fall flat on my face. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And I mean, I think those are lessons learned, right? I think, um, what I hear you saying is that make sure you put the oxygen mask on yourself first, because then you can't help anybody else if you are passed out in bed with a blanket over your head because you're so sick, you can't help anyone else. Um, I think that is extremely important. Exactly. And, and self-care is, like you said, sometimes very much overlooked by women. Um, 
And because we don't put ourselves first, a lot of the times I think we think about taking care of others and nurturing others first. But um, again, we don't think about when you fall down and you are sick, then you can't help anyone else. So that is definitely note to self that I need to make sure I'm managing my self-care and making that a priority as well. So going on and talking about, you've shared a lot how community um, and network has really kind of helped you throughout your career, especially establishing um, that uh, long, I guess, long lasting um, community you have with inroads, but then also in the various different other roles and and organizations you've been at. Um, I would, I would say, have you, what have you learned or, or, you know, do you feel like, and, and I'm going towards this, you know, A lot of women I talk about have networks, but they don't really see their networks as a resource. And so really, have you leveraged your network of colleagues, you know, mentor sponsors uh, to accelerate your success? Or do you kind of let those things kind of fall in your lap? No, I'm pretty intentional about it. And I do, you know, some activities. I started doing them very formally, um, you know, probably before I even went to Goldman uh, and then really did it in a variety of permutations there as well. Um, Because I think it's just really something that's so, so critical for women and people of color in particular to do and to do well and keep our, our eye on it. Because if you look at the best leaders in the world across the board, the best CEOs, the people who are running companies and their leadership teams, the commonality that I see across all of them, and I work with many of them, they have well-defined and well-developed networks that they know the best people to reach out to if, you know, you need someone in X function, they know someone in X function in X function to whom they can refer you. And that's something that, you know, for myself, um, particularly now as an entrepreneur, that's been really, really important. And, you know, I set a goal for myself at the start of each year. And let's just say for argument's sake that it's, you know, to have a hundred meetings. Well, then that breaks out to about 25 meetings per quarter. And I can then, you know, I mean, you know me quite well. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty, sometimes very intense with my goal setting Mm -hmm. and follow up. Um, But, you know, setting a goal that's very specific, that's measurable, that 25 meetings per quarter, you know, if we're coming up, you know, upon March and I've not had anywhere close to 25 meetings, then I know that I have not kept my eye enough on the metric that's going to actually get me to achieving sub goals that I may have throughout the year. And I think that, you know, a lot of times what becomes challenging is people want to do 10 or 12 different things. But in fact, it's actually like you should write down all the things that you'd like to do and that you you should absolutely positively dream big. But you should think about how could something like a single goal of having, say, 100 meetings per year could serve multiple goals that you may have. And so therefore, like you may actually need to think about how you are thinking about those 25 meetings per quarter. Do 10% of those meetings need to be with X type of individual. Do another 20% of those meetings need to be with another kind of individual? What are the ways in which you can create a single macro goal that helps you then get toward micro goals? Um, And I would say that that has been something, you know, that has been really critical to my success. And then oftentimes I will engage to your point earlier in the question about engaging mentors and sponsors. And I might say, who else do I need to know? Can you connect me to, and I will just go and ask for what I need. And I will ask for the introduction that I need uh, in order to enable me to, whether it's create a deeper relationship within an existing or client organization today, or it's to, you know, connect to a potential speaking opportunity or whatever the case might be. Maybe it's some business development or it's just someone that I'd like to know because maybe, 
you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm responsible for not only doing the work, but making sure that all of the things that it, you know, takes to run a company are actually happening. And sometimes I really need to lean on my network to do that. And that, again, may be in the course of my goal, which is to, you know, have X number of meetings per year. That's brilliant. I love how you um, kind of marry your uh, your commitment in your goals, right? You break down, like you said, your annual goal to quarterly goals, to monthly goals, to the weekly, to the daily goals of saying, this is how many meetings I need to have in a day or in a week or in a month in order to, you know, reach your goal. But you're also leveraging your networks to, to kind of expand your network and um, that power of proximity of, you know, your network only goes so far, but the introductions uh, to new people so that you can get new meetings and meet your goals is, is what I feel um, really important for women to understand in that, you know, ask for what you need. Like you said, you were, you know, courageous enough. And I think the other important thing you mentioned earlier is that you're always fostering those relationships and making sure that they're deep and connected relationships. So when you ask, it's not like you're trying to microwave the relationship right away and ask for a favor when you haven't really developed a relationship with somebody. So it's, it's a key thing, like you said, to balance the relationship with the ask with, you know, maintaining your goals. So really appreciate that. So in closing, Kamika, I want to, um, you to share with our audience what you think in this day of, um, digital age with AI and, you know, just machine learning, everything kind of changing. Technology is really changing the way that we do work. Um, what would you say is a key piece of advice uh, for women to continue accelerating their success and staying ahead given the future of work? That is a great question. Um, I like to keep things pretty simple in terms of three bullet points. Mm -hmm. So I will keep it to three bullet points. One is uh, always be learning. So find people, things, you know, resources, etc. that you can always make sure that you're learning. Um, the key there, though, is don't overwhelm yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to, to think about, you know, okay, is it that I really have to develop this strong relationship with this mentor this year for this particular reason? If so, that's how I'm going to be learning primarily this year. Or is it I'm going to subscribe to a publication or something, but just always be learning. Um, the second thing would be get out there more than you are today. Because most women that I encounter just really are not doing enough networking. Um, and for those who are working inside of organizations, it is paramount that you network within the organization. The people who advance in organizations are the people who are best connected. They know more about other functions than the average individual does. And that happens because they're out there networking arrange to have coffee with people and just ask them, so tell me more about your role. What is it that you do on a daily basis? Um, that information won't necessarily be useful immediately, but there will be a time where you may be needed to do something and you may be the only person who knows that it is, you know, X person in X office that you had coffee with that one time that is able to get that thing done and therefore you're the person who saves the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing is, you know, really start to document and for yourself, really, um, your, you know, brag book, brag folder, whatever the case might be, so that you get comfortable being able to tell your own story and to tell your narrative. And you can tell it from a place of power confidence and conviction. And you can really, you know, think about the 30 second version, the minute version, the five minute version, depending upon what you need it for. But again, if you don't prepare in advance, you'll just perhaps flail about and not get across the message 
uh, that you'd like for whatever particular audience. And so um, those would be my three things. And like everything else that I tell my clients, you know, the overarching thing on, on either of those three things is actually to focus and finish. So don't get overwhelmed by any of those three tasks. Keep it simple. Stay focused on it. Create a 90-day habit around it and then move on to the next one. That's great advice. And we will be sure to um, summarize those uh, for our listeners in the speaking notes. Um, And with that, I do want to um, give you an opportunity to share with our listeners the best way for them to connect with you and learn more about what you can offer them. And maybe you can share a little bit about that before you tell them uh, how to get a hold of you. Sure. So uh, our firm is KD Leadership Strategies, as I said. Uh, We're a B2B, uh, business-to-business, boutique HR consultancy. We focus on the three Cs, which is consulting, uh, executive coaching, and classroom training. Mm. Sometimes it's virtual. Uh, You can find out more about us at www.kdleadershipstrategies.com. The best way, if you'd like to reach out to me individually, is Twitter <laughs> at KDLS says KDLS says. So find me on Twitter, say hello, interact. I'd love to hear from you. Wonderful. And with that, thank you so much, Kamika, for taking the time to share your insights and your pearls of wisdom with our listeners. And uh, look forward to staying connected and following you at um, on your Twitter channel. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Monica. This is awesome. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for listening. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com, where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode. And be sure to take the quiz on the website. Your score will tell you where you are, what helps you gain momentum, and what holds you back. You'll also get a free guide with cutting-edge career strategies. We'd also love to hear from you. Share your comments and topic suggestions on IamBeyondBarriers.com, and we'll be sure to address them in future episodes. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe and rate the podcast, or just tell a friend about it. See you next episode.